Welcome my friends! I'm so excited because in this video we get to talk about one of the most common and useful discrete probability distributions, which is called the binomial distribution. So let's go ahead and get started. The binomial distribution is a discrete probability distribution which can be used when the following conditions are met. Number one, there are a fixed number of trials or observations, notated as n, similar to a sample size. Number two, each trial has two possible outcomes, which we label as success and failure. This is where bi comes from in binomial, because bi means two. Number three, each trial must be independent of the other trials, meaning the outcome on one trial has no effect on the outcome of any other trial. Number four, the probability of success is the same on each trial, which we notate as the lowercase letter p. Let's practice with checking the conditions for guessing on 10 multiple choice questions, where each question has four answers. Number one, are there a fixed number of trials? Yes, n equals 10, which are the 10 questions, and each question makes up a trial. Does each trial have two outcomes, success and failure? Yes, guessing correctly might represent success, and guessing incorrectly might represent failure. Is each trial independent? Yes. Guessing correctly on one question has no impact on whether or not the next question is guessed correctly. Is the probability of success the same on each trial? Yes, the probability of guessing correctly is going to be 25% for each question. As all four conditions have been met, guessing on a 10 multiple choice question quiz with four answers each can be modeled by the binomial distribution. Let's look at a few additional examples we are asked to decide if the binomial distribution can be used to model each situation. If so, what might represent success and what might represent failure? The first question says we are drawing five colored balls from an urn without replacement. So we need to check the four conditions. Are there a fixed number of trials? Yes, we have five colored balls that we are drawing. Does each trial have two possible outcomes? Well, we don't really know about the colors of the balls, but we could say that one color is success and all of the other colors are failure. So we could say that we have met the second condition. Number three says that each trial should be independent. Well, this is where we're going to fail because if we are drawing the balls without replacement, that means once you've chosen one ball, then there's one less ball inside the urn. And so therefore we would not be able to draw that same ball again. For example, if there was you know three blue balls in the urn and you draw one blue ball out, well, now there's one less blue ball for the next trial. So that would mean that each trial is not independent. So each draw is dependent on the previous, and therefore we cannot use a binomial distribution to model this situation. Let's look at another example. This one says we are flipping a fair coin five times. Do we have a fixed number of trials? Yes, we are flipping the coin five times. Does each trial have two outcomes? Yes, we have heads and tails. Is each trial independent? Yes, it doesn't matter what we flip on one coin, that's not going to affect any of the other flips of the coin. Is the probability of success the same in each trial? Yes, the probability of success, which might be flipping heads, would be 0.5 on each trial. So we could say that yes, we could model the situation with a binomial distribution, and we might let heads represent success and failure might be tails, or we could do it the other way around. All right, last example. Randomly sampling 15 blood donors to determine their blood type. So let's go through the conditions. Are there a fixed number of trials? Yes, we have 15 blood donors and we can consider each of those blood donors a trial. Does each trial have two possible outcomes? Well, not really, there are a lot more than two possible blood types, but like I said, you can usually shape a situation to fit condition number two. We could say that people with O positive blood would be success and any other type of blood would be failure. Success really just means whichever type of event you want to find probabilities for later. Is each trial independent? Well, yes, if we assume this truly is a random sample, then that would mean that the blood type of one person doesn't really affect the blood type of anyone else. So we could say that the trials are independent. Is the probability of success at the same on each trial? Well, yes, there is some probability of sampling someone with a particular blood type, and we would assume that is the same for each person in our sample. So as long as we have decided that we're going to have one particular blood type as our success, we could model this situation with a binomial distribution. All right, now that we've talked about how to identify if we have a binomial distribution, let's talk a little bit more about some notation and what we can do with this distribution. 
We've already mentioned that we're going to let the letter n represent the number of trials that we have. We also mentioned that we're going to let p represent the probability of success on each trial. We let q represent the probability of failure, and p and q are complements, so that you can find q by taking 1 minus p. That's like saying if there is a 70% chance of success, there would be a, well, 1 minus 70% or 30% chance of failure. We use the notation x with a little swiggly line, b i n, parentheses, n, comma p, to represent that we have a variable x which follows a binomial distribution with n trials and a probability of success p. For example, we already said that a fixed number of flips of a coin does fit the binomial distribution. So let's say that our variable x represents the number of heads that we flip out of 10. We could say that our variable x follows a binomial distribution, which just means that it has met those four conditions, and the number of trials is 10, with a probability of success of 0.5. For any binomial distribution, you can always find the mean by taking the number of trials n and multiplying by the probability of success on each trial p. You can also find the standard deviation by taking the square root of n times p times q. For our example with the coin flip, we could find the mean by taking 10, the number of trials, and multiplying by 0.5. We would get 5. This should make a lot of sense. If you're going to flip 10 coins, you would expect that on average, you would get 5 heads. On the other hand, the standard deviation can be found by taking the square root of n, which is 10, times p, which is 0.5, times q, which is 1 minus 0.5, or just 0.5 again. If you plug this into your calculator, you should get approximately 1.58. Note again that the mean of a probability distribution is frequently called the expected value. So instead of asking for mu or the mean, I might just ask for the expected value. To calculate probabilities on the binomial distribution, we're going to be using the TI-84 calculator. To reach the menu of functions, which we'll look at in just a moment, we will press the second, then VARS key. There will be two different options related to the binomial distribution. The first one is called binomial PDF, which takes three inputs n, p, and x. This stands for the binomial probability density function, which calculates the probability x is equal to some value. For example, you could use this formula to calculate the probability that x is equal to 2. The second option is what is called binomial CDF, which takes the same three inputs. This stands for binomial cumulative distribution function, which calculates the probability x is less than or equal to some value. For example, you could use this function to find the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. Let's take a look at an example. At a certain shopping center, it is known that 15% of all purchases are returned. Let's say we take a sample of size 6. If we let x represent the number of purchases that are returned out of our sample of 6, then our variable x follows a binomial distribution with 6 trials and a probability of success on each trial of 0.15 we can find the mean or expected value of this distribution by taking n and multiplying by p. We get 6 times 0.15, which is equal to 0.9. An average of about 0.9 out of a sample of 6 purchases will be returned. We can also find the standard deviation by taking the square root of n times p times q. We get the square root of 6 times 0.15 times 1 minus 0.15, which is the square root of 6 times 0.15 times 0.85 which is equal to 0 0.8746. Let's say that we are asked for the probability that exactly three purchases from the sample are returned. This is asking for the probability that x is equal to 3. If you remember from the previous slide, in order to find the probability that x is equal to one value, we can use the function called binomial PDF. So let's grab our calculator. On the calculator, we can press the second key, and then the VARS key, which is really the distribution option, right next to clear. If we scroll down, we will eventually see an option called binomial PDF. Press enter and you will be prompted for the inputs. Note that if you have a TI-83 calculator or an older TI-84, you might not be prompted with the inputs and you'll have to type in each one separated by commas. The number of trials in this case was six. The probability of success on each trial P is 0.15. The x value is going to be 3. If we go ahead and paste, you'll see what the calculator would look like if you had a TI-83 or an older version of the TI-84. Press enter and you will have calculated the probability. 
0.0415. The probability that exactly three purchases from a sample of six are returned is about 4.15%. What about finding the probability that two or fewer purchases from the sample are returned? This question is asking about the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. If you remember from the previous slide, the function on the calculator that calculates less than or equal to probabilities is what is called binomial CDF. So let's grab our calculator. We can go back to the same menu by pressing the second key and then the VARS or distribution option. Scroll down and you will eventually see the option for binomial CDF. Press enter. We still have six trials. Our probability of success on each trial is still 0.15, but now our x value is 2. Since we are using the CDF function, instead of calculating the probability that exactly 2 purchases are returned, this will calculate the probability that 2 or fewer of the purchases are returned. When we press enter, we get 0.9527. The probability that two or fewer purchases from the sample are returned is about 95.27%. Keep in mind that the TI-84, as well as most other software applications that you might use to find probabilities on a binomial distribution, only have two different functions. First we have the PDF, which calculates the equal to probabilities, and secondly we have the CDF, which calculates the less than or equal to probabilities. So what if you have something else, such as a greater than, or a greater than or equal to, or a less than probability? Well, that's what we're going to explore next. Let's say we have the same situation where x represents the number of purchases out of a sample of 6 that are returned, and x follows a binomial distribution with n equals 6 and p equals 0.15. Sometimes in these problems, it can be helpful to draw out all of the possible outcomes, which in this case are from 0 through 6. Let's say we are asked to find the probability that less than 4 purchases from the sample are returned. So we are asked for the probability that x is less than 4. Less than 4 includes the values 3, 2, 1, and 0, but does not include the value of 4. Since our calculator only calculates less than or equal to probabilities, you might want to rewrite this as the probability that x is less than or equal to 3. Then we can go to our calculator and use the CDF function with 3 plugged in for our value to x to solve this problem. You should get 0.9941 or about 99.41% as your answer. The key is to rewrite any less than probability as less than or equal to, as the binomial CDF function in the calculator will only calculate the less than or equal to probabilities. Let's look at another question. Suppose we want to find the probability that more than 3 purchases from the sample are returned. So this is asking for the probability that x is greater than 3. Well, this would include the values of 4, 5, and 6. Now, since we don't have a greater than function on our calculator, it might seem like we are out of luck. One possible solution would be to use the PDF function for 4, the PDF function for 5, and the PDF function for 6, and then add those three values together. But that's a little bit inefficient. You may remember from your study of probability that there's something called the complement rule. The complement rule says one way to find the probability of the event is to take 1 minus the probability of the complement. Well, in this case, the complement of greater than 3 would be less than or equal to 3. So we can solve the probability that x is greater than 3 by taking 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 3. Less than or equal to 3 includes the values 0 through 3. So the event 4 through 6 and the complement 3 through 0 includes all the outcomes in our sample space. At this point, we have changed a greater than problem into a less than or equal to problem, and our calculator can do the less than or equal to problems, so we can solve this using the CDF. So grab your calculator and type in 1 minus, and then go to second distribution, scroll down until you find the binomial CDF option. We still have 6 trials, we still have P of 0.15, but now we want to put in 3. And if you press uh, paste, you will see that if you scroll back to the beginning, we have 1 minus binomial CDF with the 3 plugged in. And when we press enter, we get 0 0.0059. So the probability that more than 3 purchases from the sample are returned is 0 0.0059, or about 0.59%. All right, so here is a problem for you to try. A teacher historically has a record of giving 1 in 5 students an A on his final exam. If 15 students are chosen at random, 
answer the following. So go ahead and pause the video and give these a shot and then I'll be right back to go over a few of the answers with you. All right, let's uh, discuss a couple of these here. So replace the question mark with the values of n and p. Well, n is the number of trials, which is 15, and p is the probability of success, which is 1 out of 5 or 0 0.20. What are the expected value and standard deviation? Well, the expected value is n times p, which is 15 times 0.2, or 3. And the standard deviation is the square root of npq, or the square root of 15 times 0.2 times 1 minus 0.2 for q, which is 0.8, which is about 1.55. What is the probability that none of the 15 students get an A on the final? Well, that's the same thing as the probability x is equal to 0, and we find equal to probabilities using binomial PDF. So put in 15.2 and 0, and you should get about 0 0.0352. I'll let you try this one on your own. Be very careful with the, uh, you know, they're asking for less than. They're not asking for less than or equal to, so you might need to uh, make an adjustment there. The last, end, the last one here uh, says, what's the probability that at least 6 get an A? So that's uh, the probability that x is greater than or equal to 6. Uh, but we don't have a function that does greater than or equal to, so we'll have to do the complement rule. The complement of greater than or equal to 6 is less than or equal to 5. So it's 1 minus the probability x is less than or equal to 5, which is 1 minus the CDF with 5 plugged in, which gets you about 0 0.0611. All right, the last thing to talk about is that we can make a histogram based on a binomial distribution. So let's use the same situation that we just had a second ago related to the returns at the store. And it turns out that if you enter binomial PDF without a value for x, then you'll actually get the probability for all of the outcomes. So let me show you that right here. So if you go in here and you do second distribution and you scroll down to binomial PDF and uh, you put in the trials of 6, you put in the probability of success of 0.15 and you just leave the x blank. You don't put anything in there. It'll let you paste it and then when you press enter it's going to give you all of the probabilities. So the first one here is going to be the probability that x is equal to 0. If we scroll, we'll get the probability that x is equal to 1, 2, etc., all the way through all the seven different outcomes, right? Seven outcomes because 0 is included, 0 and then 1 through 6. And so I have written out all those uh, probabilities right here. And then at this point, we really have the entire discrete probability distribution. And from this, we can create a probability histogram, which would look something like this. So from this, we can see that the most common result would be getting exactly one person uh, returning uh, whatever they had purchased, right, with about 39.9%, and then it gets less and less common as we get to the higher numbers of successes. So you may recognize this as a right-skewed histogram, and it turns out that actually based on the value for p, you can kind of predict what the histogram shape is going to be. So in general, the skewness of the binomial distribution is going to depend on that value for p. If you have a value for p which is high, higher than 0.5, then you're going to expect to see some amount of a left skewed type shape. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you have uh, you know, a high probability of success, you're going to expect to most of the time see a larger number of successes. So it's going to create that kind of uh, left skewed type shape, kind of the skewing off or tailing off as you move towards the left. On the other hand, if p is near 0.5, then the distribution is going to be symmetric, or we might even say normal, right? So if you have uh, n equals 6 and p equals 0.5, you're going to expect to see something like this. And if you have a low value for p, then you're most likely going to have a skewed right distribution that's going to look something a little bit more like this. Uh, note that if you had a very, very high uh, value for n, then actually all of them end up looking a little bit more normal. But for uh, a relatively small value for n, you're going to expect to see these types of shapes. So remember, whenever you have a high value for p, you're going to have skewed left. A low value for p would be skewed right. And a value that is close to 0.5, you're going to expect to be normal or symmetrical. All right, I think that is all I had to say here today about the binomial distribution. So hopefully you found it interesting and useful, and I will see you in the next video. The binomial PDF for four. The binomial PDF for three. Welcome, my friends. I'm so excited because in this video, we get to talk about one of the most common discrete... <laughs> what?